good morning. All right, three of you who are awake, good to see you this morning. Glad, glad you are uh, here with us today. Let me also say uh, welcome to those of you who are joining us online for uh, the first day of our new live stream from the Modern Service. You may have heard a few months ago, we're talking about updating some equipment, getting some things in, and so that is in. Today's our first day that we're uh, broadcasting the Modern Service live, uh, multiple cameras and angles and all that sort of stuff. So it's produced a lot differently than if you watched before. So for those of you in the room, if you're away in upcoming weeks, and those of you online know that our upcoming schedule is at 9.15, the blended service will be live stream, and at 11, it'll be the modern service that's live stream. So that note for you, so you can uh, adjust accordingly. And I uh, just want to say welcome to those of you who are online. Well, all of you, whether in the room or online, take your Bibles, turn with me to the book of James chapter 2. James chapter 2. We've been reading through the New Testament in 2020. We're nearing the end. Uh, got uh, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Jude, and Revelation. So our little inside joke from the venue, don't tell him I sent you, is for you to reach out to Pastor Dave and tell him how excited you are about hearing his Christmas messages from the book of Revelation. <laughs> That's going to be awesome, all right? Now we're going to edit that out of live stream so he doesn't know that came from me, all right? So you guys ask about that. Uh, we'll, we'll continue reading through. Well, as we turn the page into James today, uh, let me just encourage you, if you don't already do this, let me encourage you to start this for your future uh, study of the Bible. Anytime you start a new book, one of the very first things you should do is take a few minutes and read some background, get some understanding of that book. If nothing else, go to the introduction of a, of a good study Bible and just read. Who's the author? Who's the background? Who's the audience? It's always very, very helpful for you to understand that because when you begin reading the book, you'll be familiar with some of those things. And so today, as we get into James, I wanted to tell you, if you had done that, you would have probably discovered these things. The author of James is a man named James. However, there are several of those in the New Testament. So you're like, well, which one is it? Well, James, this particular James, is the half-brother of Jesus. Had the same mom, different dads. Obviously, Jesus was God. James uh, was not. And so he's a half-brother of Jesus. And, interestingly enough, he did not believe in Jesus while Jesus ministered and was alive on earth. Now, before you're kind of hard on James, I mean, just think about this. If you have a sibling, how hard would it have been for them to convince you that they were a perfect child of God, right? I mean, just, just imagine growing up around that. I mean, you know, here are his parents. Why can't you be more like Jesus, James? I mean, when Jesus was your age, he was teaching the, the leaders in the temple, you know, kind of stuff, and just being out in the community. Oh, you're Jesus, brother or sister. I just love him. Isn't he the greatest? Yeah, yeah. So... But when Jesus was crucified, he resurrected from the dead, revealed himself. James did understand who he was, what he came to do. He believed in him, and he became a leader in the early church. By the time we get to Acts chapter 15, he's called James the Elder. Like he is the, the, the highest ranking among other brothers in the Christian faith at the church of Jerusalem who's giving instruction for the church that has been born since Jesus' resurrection. So that's the author. Uh, it's probably the first book written in the New Testament, one of the earliest books that we have recorded. So there's that little uh, note for it. James uh, wrote this book in very proficient Greek, but it's written to a Jewish audience. Some people have called James a Christian Jew because of so much Christian heritage that's in the book of James, but he was very knowledgeable, very proficient in his Greek language. Uh, and as you read through the book, you'll see he is so rooted in the Old Testament heritage and history for the Jewish people that there he, he makes quotations from 21 books in the Old Testament. Now, for you math whizzes out there, there are 66 books in the Old Testament, so he quotes 21 one-third of the Old Testament is quoted in the book of James, and there are only 108 verses in the book of James. So a lot of Jewish history and heritage there. We'll see a couple of references to that to this, uh, this morning. James is considered a general epistle. Uh, Ryan earlier mentioned the book of Thessalonians. You get Colossians, you get Philippians. Those letters were written to churches in specific cities. A general epistle like James and like John that we'll get to, those were written to groups of churches that were to be distributed among a, a large group of people in a demographic area. And James has written that it's not a teaching, a doctrinal book. It's like a sermon. It's a message that he preached to people which leads to the next point of his focus being on action. There's a real bent toward because of your faith in Christ, because you say you follow God as a Christian, these are things that should be evidenced in your life. One of the most famous verses uh, in James's book is faith without works is? 
Okay, yeah. You guys never read James before. Good, we're going to get a first chance today. Yeah, faith without works is dead. There's this real bent toward action. As a matter of fact, uh, in, in the Greek language, as people were writing, there's a mood called imperative. And imperative was a command. Kind of think of it like putting an exclamation point on something. You're told to do something, do it with emphasis, do it w- with, with haste. I mean, get right to it. In James's 108 verses, there are 54 imperatives. All right, math whizzes. What's the percentage of that? 50%. Man, y'all are slow on the draw today. You stayed up late watching that ball game last night, didn't you? Yeah, they were 54 of the 108 verses. So every other verse, so to speak, has an imperative command where James is saying, go, do, think, respond. This is what God has called us to. So we'll see that in his book. And because of this, this bent to action, I couldn't find who first said it, but I saw where several uh, pastors and teachers had referenced, and this is my favorite summary of James. They said, James is the gospel in overalls. It's the gospel in overalls. Hey, you believe in Jesus, then let's go to work. And so in that, just as with all epistles, the the author writes to address a group of believers in the early church to say, hey, now that you believe in Christ, this is what that should mean. And so sometimes they clarify doctrine, theology, sometimes it's action. And so they begin to address issues that were taking place in these local congregations that they were hearing about. So they could then say, because of your faith in Christ, this is how you should handle this situation or these circumstances. And that's what James does. In James 2, he addresses the sin of partiality. He tells us we are not to commit the sin of being partial to certain people. And uh, we're going to look at why he does that. It's because of who God is. And so that's the message title today, God is. And because of who God is, we should respond and behave in these ways on this topic. So James chapter 2, verse 1, he says, My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. So the first thing to understand is this. God is impartial. So his followers should be too. God is impartial, so his followers should be too. Verse 1 clearly says, because of your faith in Jesus Christ, he's the Lord of glory, we should show no partiality because God shows no partiality. Now, we will not be perfect in this, just as we're not God, but we can still give our best effort. And so James says, Here's what you're to not do, and then he illustrates it. James uses more illustrations, more word pictures, uh, more object lessons in his 108-verse epistle than Paul does in all of his writings together. So he gives one of these illustrations here in verse 2. It's a hypothetical, but it's still something that was happening. This specific instance didn't happen this way, but this general uh, experience was taking place. He says, For if a man wearing a gold ring... Now, the ESV says a gold ring. Some translations say gold-fingered. And what that means is a person would come in with more than one gold ring on a finger. And you know why they did that? To show that they were wealthy. They wanted people to know that they were a very wealthy, a well-to-do person. So they would wear all of these rings, which would give them as what we call today bling, right? They, they, they wore this around. So they would have these gold-fingered people. Sometimes they would wear so many rings, they would lose functionality of fingers and couldn't do things for themselves. So you know what they had? Servants, which only added to their aura of, look at me, how important I am. People wait on me and do things for me because I have so many gold rings on my finger. So James says, if this wealthy, well-to-do, prominent person comes in, he says, dressed in fine clothing, this word for fine clothing means bright or brilliant, which was another sign of wealth. If a person had money to get brightly colored uh, clothing articles, that showed their prominence in that day because most was very bland, very earth tones, very drab clothing. So if with a gold ring, fine clothing comes into your assembly, this word for assembly is the the Jewish word for synagogue. So understand this. James is saying when a person comes to worship, this is now the body of believers who are gathered together with faith in Christ. You're gathered together for worship, and this person comes in, and he says, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in. You know what the phrase poor man in shabby clothing means? It means a poor man in shabby clothing. That's my seminary degree coming out for you right there. So you've got this wealthy person comes in, and then you have this really poor person that comes in to your worship gathering. And James says this, if you pay attention to the one who wears fine clothing, 
This is an amazing phrase and idea here. This pay attention means to examine one's face closely. Thanksgiving's coming up, Christmas is coming up. I don't know if you had these relatives or not, but when you would show up and they would walk in and they would grab you by the face and go, oh, it's so good to see you and squeeze the cheeks or the ears or whatever. And you're like, get off me, you know, this kind of deal that's there. That is kind of the idea here of this person's coming in and they're grabbing and they're looking at, they're honoring this wealthy person who comes in. In my experience, the other time that people would grab and examine my face that closely to make a judgment, which is what it is, you're looking at a person to make a judgment to decide something something was when I was supposed to take a bath as a kid. I went through this season where I apparently didn't like taking baths and so I would go do it and I would come back in and tell my mom that I'd taken a bath and she would say, come here. And I was like, oh snap, I'm in trouble now because mom would then come and grab my face and turn it this way and look behind the ears and then she would pick up and look, you know, under the neck and then the same thing, brushing the teeth, blowing my face and then I learned to just rub the toothpaste on, you know, there are all these tricks back and forth, but it's this idea of of inspection to make a decision. Is this person of worth, of value and and of something good? And this word, this fascinates me. In ancient times, this word for paying close attention was only used in Christian writings. You only found it in writings addressed to Christians. You may be like, yeah, so what? Well, here's the interesting part of that. Only the church addressed it to say, this is wrong. Because in popular culture and society in that day and time, it was just readily accepted that that's what you do. When you see a person and you make a, a judgment, they're, they're wealthy, they're famous, they're powerful, then you give them a place of prominence. You exalt them. You do special things for them because of who they are. They're important. They deserve it. And these other people, they're not as important. It's only addressed in Christian writings because the secular world and society accepted it as right and true and the way things are. And you know, years have clicked by, centuries, millennia have clicked by, but that condition is still true among humanity. We make decisions on people's worth, value, their merit, based on externals rather than what God sees, which is the heart and the value and the worth of all people. So James says, if you look and you pay attention to the one who wears fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down at my feet. Have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? This word to the poor man, uh, it says, sit under my feet here. Uh, It's the idea for sit under my footstool is the actual word. So people would sit, they would have a place to prop their feet up, like the ottoman at your house. And then they would tell the poor person, you're not even valuable enough for me to remove my feet and at least let you have the stool. You just sit right here on the floor below my feet that are sitting on a footstool. I mean, it's this ultimate disrespect. And James says, if you do that, you've become judges with evil thoughts. Well, what's the evil thought? The evil thought is this. This person is valuable. This person has merit. This person has worth this person does not. We basically are making the decision of a person's worth and value from our perspective and our criteria, which is not God's perspective or God's criteria, because all people are created in the image of God and are worthy of respect and honor and of basic kind and courteous treatment, regardless of whether they have money or not. So this is the point that James drives home for believers. Because God is impartial, we should be as well. Now, I'm not a doctor and I don't play one on TV, but you've all been to a doctor and they're going to treat you for something or or do something and they will sometimes say, this is going to hurt a little. Well, I'm just going to tell you, we're going to delve into this a little bit and this may sting a little bit. But James tells us in chapter 1, we are to be doers of God's word, not hearers only. And he gives this picture of looking into a mirror and saying, oh, there's me in the mirror. And we do whatever, and then we turn and we walk away and then go, what do I look like again? Well, we don't do that. We know what we look like in a mirror. He says God's word serves as a mirror for us that we should look into God's word and say, am I doing what it says? And if we look closely and we look deeply and we're not... We need to bring our lives, our actions, our responses in line with what God's Word teaches. So I want to ask you this morning, 
Are you an impartial person? Now, your first initial response is, no, I'm not an impartial person, which is what I thought you were going to say. But Jeremiah tells us that the heart is deceitfully wicked and who can trust it? So maybe if we look at a little longer in the mirror and we think a little deeper, we might realize that we do sometimes maybe have a tendency toward impartiality and showing favoritism or biases or prejudices against certain people. Now, what I want you to do is think through your thought life and maybe your emotional response. I thought about putting pictures up on the screen this morning. I thought, no, I'm just going to kind of leave it to your own imagination because here's the truth of the matter. We all have these internal dialogues and you have these own images and things that fit you as a unique person individual. But think about what is your response when you see the prototypical biker dude? Guy, big burly guy, big old long beard, wearing his, you know, uh, black leather jacket, chaps, all this kind of stuff, you know, gruff looking. You You see that person out in public walking down the street coming at you. What's your response to that? Some of you are like, I don't have one. Well, good. That, one, that one's not one that triggers you in some way. What about a person, all kinds of tattoos all over their body, their arms, the, the neck, the big face tattoos. You've seen some of these images, gauges in the ears, piercings, eyes, nose, mouth, tongue, all this kind of stuff. The people with you know, the gauges and the holes in their jaw. When you see those images, what's your internal response to that? Or when you see that person in person, in proximity that you can speak, or not speak and engage or avoid? What's your response? Don't tell me. I'm just kind of asking for you to evaluate here through the Holy Spirit searching our hearts a little bit. What about when you see a homeless person? What's your response or thought process to that? What about if it's a black person, a black teen, a black male, Hispanic, Asian, some other ethnicity? And the reverse works as well. Maybe you struggle, you, you've had a difficult time your entire life financially and making ends meet and things like that. And you see someone who has lots of name brand clothing and a really nice house and a really nice car. Is there jealousy or envy that comes into your mind when you think those things? Some of you are like, man, he's going to meddling this morning. Hey, this is what God's word does to us. It takes us and says, are we reflecting the character and nature of God? And it doesn't have to be external. Sometimes it can be a personality or a temperament. Do personality types, that outgoing, bubbly, loud personality type, does it annoy you? Don't point at anybody. Don't elbow your spouse. Maybe you look at introverted personality types and are like, what's wrong with them? Why can they not have a conversation? Why can't they talk? Why can't they engage? Do you ever secretly think that it would be awesome to see proud, arrogant, prideful people not succeed at something? Do you wish something negative or bad would maybe come their way? What about members of the LGBTQ community that you see a part of and promoting? How do you respond to those things? What are your, what's your inner dialogue? What are your emotional responses, your thoughts when given the opportunity to engage or avoid or do whatever? You're like, well, none of those bother me. Well, kudos for you, but also, are you looking in the mirror long enough? But if not, then here's all of us. What goes through your mind when you pass people driving slow in the fast lane? Uh Uh-huh. See? busted, aren't you? Well, you're okay there because the Bible says those people are beyond hope, so it's, it's fine. But here's, here's what I'm getting at. When you see individuals, when you're confronted with persons in the world we live in, do you sometimes make judgments and place valuation and a value on a person based on a number of things? Whatever your own personal background dialogue is. The Bible says God is impartial, and we as his children should be impartial as well. And consider this. Where did James say this was happening? In worship. When they gathered together as the assembly, they were showing this favoritism. So to make this even more personal, what if some of those individuals I just mentioned came in and sat down 
near you, not next to you because it's COVID season, but what if they sat down near you in worship or in your Sunday school class? What's your response? In worship. We're here as God's people to gather together. Do you avoid? Avoid eye contact, steer away, move over to a different seat? Or do we engage and have conversation, show kindness and acceptance and get to know that person? Well, I want to give you four things. I want to encourage you to write these down, uh, consider these as responses to this, and we're going to move on. Number one, pray about your attitude. Some of you are like, man, my spouse tells me that multiple times a week. But seriously, pray about your attitude. And it's a simple prayer. God, do I see people like you see people? And if the answer is no, anywhere on that scale, pray and say, God, help me see people like you see people. So pray about your attitude. Secondly, befriend someone who doesn't look, act, or think like you. Be assertive. Be the initiator. Build that relationship with a person who is different from you, who maybe causes one of these emotional reactions with you. Go and build that relationship. You may just find that they're more like you than what you think. But this sin of impartiality and of avoidance has kept you from engaging in that way. Number three, walk toward the messes. Walk toward the messes. Life is messy, and you know what people are? People are messy. We've all got messes in our lives. We are all messes. And I just want to encourage you to walk toward the messes. I will never forget the Holy Spirit reminding me of this truth and demonstrating it very real. We were in Florida a number of years ago. We were sitting at a restaurant. A young lady had come through. She picked up all the, the uh, plates and the silverware and stuff from a table that, that she was cleaning. She had it on her tray, and she turned. And I don't know if things shifted or what happened, but she dropped it. Everything fell off on the floor. It was that loud crash. It's that moment where everybody's like, Oh, we feel so sorry for her. That's super embarrassing because everybody's now looking, you know, conversation dead silent in the restaurant. And I'm sitting there in that moment of, oh, man, I would hate for that to be me in this. And within, I'm talking seven, eight seconds, a lady from a table hops up, puts her napkin aside, gets down there on the floor, and is helping the server pick up and put things on this tray. And man, in that moment, the Holy Spirit gripped my heart and said, Curtis, why didn't you help I felt bad. I felt terrible for her, but I didn't help. And that's been a reminder to me that, yes, life is messy. Man, sometimes people are messy, but walk toward the messes. Because you know what we would want? We would want someone to walk toward and help us with our mess, would we not? That's what the Bible calls us to. And you may say, well, I, I, I can't help everybody, so I, I shouldn't help any. Well, why don't we change our perspective from since you can't help all don't help one to this. Why don't you do for one what you wish you could do for all? Make a difference for the one. Do for one what you wish you could do for all. Make a difference for the one, and here's what I can assure you. You will never know. There's no way you can measure the impact and the effect of helping and being engaged with one person can make in that person's life and potentially their eternity and the eternity of many others. So walk toward the messes. And the final thing is this. Be a godly host at church. We, our church, our staff need you to help us be good hosts to people who come and visit Geyer Springs. When you host someone at your home, you clean up, you get ready, you greet them, you give them instructions. Hey, the bathroom's over here. Here's this, here's whatever. You give them the good seats. You give them your recliner. You give them your footstool or the ottoman that goes with it. I mean, you, you do this for a guest that's there. Guys, when we gather at worship, this isn't about us. We're God's people. We're God's family. We're here to help be a good host to those who attend. So look around. Find people you don't know. Introduce yourself. Get to know them. And I know this happens in a large church. People are like, I'm afraid to go talk to somebody because they might be a member here already. And I'll go up and introduce myself. They're like, I've been a member here for 20 years. And I'll feel embarrassed. Big stinking deal. Get over yourself and engage people because it's better for you to go and suffer a little bit of that embarrassment with a person who's a member here than for a guest to be sitting in this room to leave this church and go to work tomorrow and say, you know what? I went to that Guyer Springs First Baptist Church yesterday. I sat in worship and not a single person said anything to me. 
because we were afraid or we thought, we assumed that they were already a member. Look, I've done that more times than I can shake a stick at. My son, who's in college, had a buddy he was in the, the student ministry with, and that kid went up to college. He came back, was in this room about two years later, and I look over and I see this guy, clean shaven, sitting with a, a young lady that I didn't know. So I went over and I said, hey, my name's Curtis. Are you guys new here? And Reese Graham looked at me with a clean shaven face and said, are you for real? And I was like, Reese? I'd never seen the kid without a beard. I was mortified. I about died that, I mean, I know this guy. I went on mission trips with him, and I didn't recognize him without his beard. But you know what? It's okay. We laugh about it to this day. It's fine. Be a good host when we're at church. Okay. Have I driven that point home enough? Okay, let's move on. God cares for the poor, so his followers should too. This is about the rich. Look at verse 5. Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he has promised to those who love him? God has a special affinity and concern for the poor and the downtrodden and the outcasts of this world. And because God cares for the poor, we should too. It's very clear in Scripture. You cannot make a counter-argument that God says we should not be concerned, burdened, and actively engaged in helping care for the poor and the outcast in the world. You cannot make that argument biblically. You can make it some other ways and be living in sin, but don't even try and say that the Bible does not teach that principle and that truth. Therefore, you are not obligated out of obedience to God and His Word to help those who are poor in this world. Two verses uh, from Proverbs, Proverbs uh, 21, whoever closes his ear to the cry of the poor will himself call out and not be answered. Proverbs 31, open your mouth, judge righteously, defend the rights of the poor and the needy. So God calls us to care for and minister to the needs of the poor. One opportunity we have going on right now is our joy project, our joy to the world, our joy to the community. We have opportunities and ways for you to get engaged. The Operation Shoe Boxes are down front. You've seen those in the foyer if you come in that way uh, on Sunday mornings. Numbers of ways that are going on now. December 4th through the 8th, we're going to host the Compassion Experience. They're going to bring a, a semi-trailer in. That, that trailer, as you go through this experience, shows you the room sizes of people living in third world impoverished co countries, gives you kind of the daily experience of what life is like in those areas. And then there's an opportunity that you could adopt a compassion child. We went through this several years ago as a family in Virginia, uh, adopted a child uh, who's in Haiti now. He's Daniel's age. We write letters to him. He writes to us, so we get that a couple times a year. We're able to send a special gift at his birthday at Christmas. And so we've been a part of that for a couple of years because of that experience. So if that's something that you want to investigate, mark that on your calendars and come checking it out. But here's the bottom line. We are to help care for the poor. James goes on and he says, but you have dishonored the poor man. Uh, he says, are not the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? And so James actually says there's a whole separate uh, area of sin and temptation that befalls rich people. When you're wealthy, they're the ones who are oppressing the poor, they're taking from the poor, they're doing all these sort of things. And James says we must guard against that. We must help the poor when we've been blessed with wealth. And living in America, we have been blessed with that. You may be like, well, mine's not this one over here. Doesn't matter your scale and where you fall in that. We are a very wealthy people and a, a congregation that God has blessed with the opportunity to be a blessing to many, many more. So, God cares for the poor, we should as well. Third, God is holy and his followers should be too. Look at verse 8. If you, are re if you really fulfill royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. Remember this Old Testament reference? Here's Leviticus 19. This is the second greatest commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. What's the first greatest commandment? Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Then the second, love your neighbor as yourself. Why does James, in an area of not showing partiality and, and an area of caring for others, say, love your neighbor as yourself to repeat Jesus' word? He said that because you know who we care for in life? Ourselves. When you're hungry, what do you do? You eat. 
Any of you just love to be cold? You're like, man, when it's 28 degrees, I like to just go outside and walk around in my, my socks and a pair of shorts. That's it. Just, I love to be cold. Anybody love to be cold? No. When you get cold, what do you do? You turn up the heat. You put on some clothes. You know, you do whatever. The same thing when you get hot, you turn on the, fa- the air conditioning. We care for ourselves. We don't like to be lonely and left out. Therefore, if you see someone who looks like they could be lonely or left out, engage, encourage, come alongside that person so they feel included because you would want to be included. We were talking about this at our our family as we were reading through this week, and Anna said, that's like the golden rule. Do to others as you would have them do to you. I was like, that's exactly right. Jesus is reminding us that Jesus is always right. Love your neighbor as yourself. Do to others like you would have them do to you. God's law, God's word. Because God is holy, we are called to be holy as well. Because we're called to do this, but you know what we don't do? What we're called to do. Uh, Next verse, verse 9. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. Now, the, the two different definitions here. Sin means to fall short. There's a mark and you try to do something and you didn't make it. Do not lie. Well, I lied. Okay, I, I fell short. Well, then he goes on and says, if you do this, then you you are convicted by the law as a transgressor. A transgressor is someone who went too far. So, yeah, we're supposed to provide for ourselves and provide for our family. And so we we work and we have jobs and we have wealth and we pay our bills and we do this. Well, then we begin to get greedy and we want more money and we want more power. We want more. And so then we go past just getting our needs covered. So it's greed, that's a transgressor. So sins to fall short, transgressor is to go too far over the line. That's what my family says a lot. Here's the line and there goes dad, right over the line, right? So that's what the Bible says is sometimes we fall short, sometimes we go too far, but we sin. And and, uh, James goes on and says in verse 10, for whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery, woo, I didn't do that one, but you do murder, you've become a transgressor of the law. So when you break one part of it, you've broken all of it. And when you break the one part of it, do you know what you deserve? The consequences of that, which the Bible says is sin. I mean, think of it this week. The most poisonous animal in the world is a poisonous dart frog. They say that two micrograms of the venom from a poisonous frog would fit on the the head of a pen. You've got a 20-ounce soft drink in your hand. You take that two micrograms, the pen drop, drop into your soft drink. You're going to finish that bottle? You'd be like, "Uh, no, I think I'm going to pass, right? Because that one drop has now polluted everything. That's what sin does. Or, Or another kind of word picture for this is something that happened in our family two years ago. We took Caleb to Liberty City in Virginia. We were on our way home, and we stopped in a corner of Tennessee where there is nothing but a gas station. We were having some van issues, and so we pulled in. So I get out. I was going to go to the restroom, come back, check on the van stuff. Shelly was there. I thought, well, she may be here a minute or whatever. So I was just kind of thinking about myself to go in and do what I was going to do to work on the van. Shelly gets out. Caleb gets out. We're walking toward the the gas station door. And Shelly says, do you have the keys? And I said, no. Do you have the keys? And she said, I just locked the door. Now, there's still much debate about who was at fault that day in the Barnes household. But long story, a little bit shorter, we were there for several hours trying to figure out alternatives. We were too far from Memphis to get Papa Lock to come out, too far from Jackson, Tennessee to get him to come that way. I had to go to a guy who pulled in and said, sir, do you have a hammer? And I took that hammer and I smashed out the driver's, or the passenger side window of our van and we drove home in the cold in November when we stopped at Walmart and got a paint, painting tarp to wrap over It was a long, cold ride home, and I don't mean because of the temperature that was outside of that van. But when I hit that glass, it shattered everywhere. Ten days ago, I was getting the, had the van clean, was vacuuming it out. I found a piece of glass from that instance that came out from under one of our seats. It was everywhere. That's the picture of sin. When we commit a sin, our holiness before God, our righteousness, our efforts to say, God, we're going to do what you want us to do, it's completely shattered. Just by one sin. And here's the thing, let's be honest. Sin is like Lay's potato chips. You don't commit just one, right? People are like, oh, well, I just committed the one sin. Okay, you want to say you just committed one, you ain't fooling nobody but yourself, right? We know we're not a single sinner. We have sinned. We deserve the consequences of that. 
Which leads us to the last thing that James reminds us of is that God, in his mercy to us, God is merciful, therefore we should show mercy to others. It says in verse 12, so speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. We're going to be judged, but the law of liberty says we've been set free. We've been forgiven from our sins because Jesus took our punishment. God didn't just excuse our sin, sweep them under the rug. He punished our sin in Jesus so that we could receive Jesus' perfection. So he says, judge as those who are under liberty. We've been set free from sin, so we should also extend that liberty, that grace that we've received to other people without impartiality. And he says, for judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. You want to be hypocritical? You've been shown mercy, but you don't show it to someone else. Jesus addressed that a number of times in his ministry. He says, if you don't show mercy, you're not going to get mercy. But you show mercy that you've received from God, God bestows that mercy upon us. And then he wraps up by saying, mercy triumphs over judgment. That's our story of salvation. And because of what we've received, we should share that with others. And so I want to leave you with that this morning. You have received an indescribable gift in God's grace and his forgiveness for your sins. And now God calls you and he calls me to go and share this with other people without impartiality. So for our time of response, we're, I'm going to pray for us in a moment, and we're going to sing a song, come to the altar, and it talks about the forgiveness that we've, been, that we've received, that we've, been forget, that we've been forgiven of through Christ. And I want you to think of this idea of an altar is where we come and we offer something to God to say, God, I offer myself to you. Lord, help me now go and show and share what I've received and do it without impartiality.